some of you from bigger areas may be like, active transportation in rural areas, is this really something that happens? Yes. So two communities that have us on the screen are communities that Joy works in. Um, Tallulah, you'll see I've got a 10-minute bike shed up there. So that's a 10-minute biking distance from the center of town. You can see Tallulah's got a nice grid there. It's got a couple of roads that, per, that are higher speed that cause some severance. But they are addressable. These aren't like huge urban artil um, ah, like arterials. Thank you. Um, these are roads that really could be addressed to make active transportation truly feasible. There's terrible sidewalk infrastructure. So there's a lot of issues with ADA accessibility. There's a lot of places where there aren't sidewalks. But with funding, these could become truly walkable, bikeable communities. All the destinations in both of these communities are right there. You've got the school, the grocery store, the pharmacy, the churches, the library, like everything is right there in these communities and that, that is feasible. Before we dive in deeper, so transportation alternatives is one of the primary funding sources for sidewalks and bike lanes for all of you. So this program is in every state and the budget has gotten bigger for every state after the Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act so that there's an opportunity for all of us. So Brian's gonna talk about the before times. Yeah, well, you can see up there, our last call for projects, we had one application from a rural community. That's all. And it's, if you look at our list of hundreds of projects that we have, there are only three total from rural areas or areas with less than 5,000 population. And there's a dedicated funding source just for that group, but we can't reach them. Um, part of the problem here is that a sidewalk or a shared use path or a bike lane it costs just as much to build in St. Joseph or in Tallulah as it does in Baton Rouge, New Orleans. But the difference is that the tax base is about 100 times bigger in those NPO areas. So another thing that's unique to Louisiana with the transportation alternatives, the way it's set up, you know, federally it's 80-20. But in Louisiana, we do 80-20 for construction only. So your design is 100% local responsibility, your construction engineering, your inspection, that's all 100% local. So this is my most recent local example is the town of Grand Coteau, 947 people there, okay? They called me when, they, when I get sent the letters and you're accepted, you're in the program, I'm so excited. They were the first ones to call, they're ready to go. So let's have a kickoff meeting. So first, I had to find where Grand Coteau was. <laughs> but once I located, I drove out there and I met with the mayor and the city clerk. And we sat down. She was so excited about this $500,000 project she was going to have. But then I started getting the details with her. I said, okay, look, it's 80-20, so 20% you have to come up with. That's $100,000. Oh, and by the way, you got to design it yourself. So using about a 10% estimate for design, that's another $50,000. Same thing for construction, engineering, and inspection. I need full-time inspections, federal money. That's another 10%, another $50,000. So this $500,000 project that she was so excited about, now yeah. it's going to cost that town $200,000. And they likely don't have it, but if they do have $200,000, they have a higher priority than a sidewalk that they want to spend on. So that was a huge barrier for me. Another barrier, there's a stigma with the Department of Transportation and these small towns. They see us come out there and we, we're out there to work on that highway at the edge of town. And that's it. We're not touching anything inside. But they think, they think the state doesn't care. They think the feds don't care. Mm -hmm. And you get an experience like Grand Coteau, one bad experience, they go to a, a mayor's meeting, they tell other mayors and say, you know what, somebody else gets excited about the TAP program. Well, this mayor, like, don't even bother. You know, don't, don't worry about it. It's not worth it. So they get that don't bother attitude and then there's the stigma against the state and we end up stuck with a whole bunch of money. So Joy, as I said, is the is one of our CDC hop agents in Louisiana. So she's the on the ground person. So she's gonna tell us a bit about two of the communities she works in doing this kind of work. All right, so to give you all a, a lot more context about the communities we serve in Louisiana, um, Tinsaw Parish, um, the entire parish has a population of less than 5,000 people, but today we're going to focus on the city of St. Joseph, but just keep that in mind. The entire parish is less than 5,000 people. It is a majority Black population, and it has a 45% adult obesity rate. In that same vein, we have the city of Tallulah, which is, we're talking about the main city in the parish. Um, their population is just over 6,000. They are also majority Black, and they, have, they also have a high adult obesity obesity rate sitting at 46%. These are communities, as you saw on the map that Jessica showed, these are communities that people should be able to walk and bike 
But like she mentioned earlier, there are a lot of barriers with the pedestrian infrastructure that make people feel unsafe, that make people feel as though they don't, they should not walk or bike and that they would probably rather get in a car. Um, so they face a lot of barriers. And on top of having issues with broadband access and brown water coming out of the tap, transportation is absolutely one of the things that's on the list, but it probably isn't at the top of the list because we have so many things that we're fighting. But with the funding that we have through the CDC High Obesity Program, agents like myself are able to work very closely with these communities, identify those community leaders, and identify barriers and solutions to a lot of these barriers that they face as far as physical activity and nutrition. So to tell you a little bit more about these coalitions, um, both of the coalitions, uh, well, all the coalitions, but both of the coalitions I'll talk to you about today are comprised of our elected officials, um, they are our faith-based organizations, our food pantry managers, and just everyday people that live, work, walk, bike, and exist in these cities. Um, and both of these parishes have what we call our connectivity plans. And these connectivity plans have really been growing since 2017. Um, and they're done in conjunction with our partners at the Center for Planning Excellence. And what they do is it's, it's basically, they help us identify some of, some of the solutions that we may not always have the answers to. Um, I can go to the mayor and say, hey, we have this sidewalk that's broken, but he, he probably won't know exactly what you know, we'll need to do to fix that, but CPEX does, so they help us identify that. So both of those projects have grown. Um, and to tell you specifically about Madison Parish, um, that connectivity plan was enhanced by the Madison on the Crawl event. If you see the kids with the, the yellow signs, um, they were going to put those signs out in 2020. Um, and we had, it was basically a, a walk audit event where we were gathering community input. And we were able to do that along um, the most pedestrian heavy route on in our community. And we were also able to get some input on one of our pocket parks as well. Um, and we also did a walk audit. Um, we actually just did that last month. If you see the one with my, my first grade teacher waiting, um, we did a walk audit uh, last month to identify a new area of work that we're gonna add to the connectivity plan. Same with St. Joseph. Um, we had the pop-up park and community event and the bike repair station installed. If you see Mayor Alexander there, um, that was installed last May. Now these community coalitions, again, they work to identify what the barriers are. And even though our funding can provide some solutions, we can't provide all the solutions. And the whole purpose of us working to find the additional funding and the additional support comes from the sentiment that Mayor Alexander of St. Joseph shares with us. If you don't have a safe place to walk and bike, you feel like you really don't have permission to do it. So the whole purpose of us trying to work with these communities is really just to help enhance it and make it easier for folks to walk and bike to their everyday destinations. All right, so then I'm at the state level working with agents like Joy. She's got all this great energy. She's got all this great community involvement and I'm trying to help them figure out what next. So I'm you know, building relationships at DOTD. I'm trying to figure out how can they actually get this stuff built? So CDC is a huge source for funding for personnel and can fund these small things, but it can't fund sidewalks. It can't fund these like bigger infrastructure pieces. So I'm, you know, asking the DOT to run crash data. There's no bike and pedestrian crashes in this area. I'm looking at, well, what about safe routes to school? Doesn't that's not really an option for these areas? I I learned that rec trails can actually do sidewalks. So I said, oh, maybe rec trails. Rec trails is 80-20, but can use in kind as a part of that 20. So that's like, okay, this could be more feasible for a rural community. Both of Joy's main communities have active rec trails applications because they were looking at, you know, city labor, city machinery, land donation to kind of supplement that 20% to make it possible. But rec trails caps out at 100,000. And that's just a drop in the bucket for these projects. That's not a real solution for these towns connectivity issues. So about a year ago, um, the CDC hosted a webinar focused on changes to the IIJA. And so Marisa from Safe Routes Partnership and a few other people were talking through like, what are all the opportunities? So Marisa went through changes in TAP, transportation alternatives, and my ears got really big. I'm like, wait. So I'd never considered TAP before because I knew it was 80-20. People had mentioned Brian to me. I'm like, ah, I don't even want to talk to that guy because it's like his program. Because <laughs> he was just so out so his program was, I knew it was not worth mentioning to the communities because it was an impossible ask. But hearing on this webinar that there's new flexibility, new changes, I was like, ooh. 
And Marisa said she was open through the CDC for technical assistance. So I called her the next day. I'm like, Marisa, help us. So we started to talk through um, uh, yeah, you got that one. Yeah, so so I started talking with her and then started meeting with Brian. Yeah, so like I said before, there's money dedicated to these less than 5,000 and actually IIJA, I doubled it for Louisiana. So I got money I already can't spend and now they doubled it so I got more money that I can't spend. So it becomes, how do I reduce this burden? There had to be a way that I could reduce the burden and at least the rural communities. So otherwise, I'm just going to end up sending money back to the federal government, which is not what we want to do. I don't want any funds to lapse on this active transportation type project stuff. So again, this is Louisiana only, but you know, in the in the new law, you can use HSIP funding to match. So that's easy. So I went to our safety section. And I said, "All right, just give me some HSIP funding, and I want to match some of these communities." Got told no. Okay. That's easy. All right. So then I started thinking again, what else could I use? I said, maybe there's some CMAC funding that I could use, you know, partner with CMAC to do some bigger projects. So I went to our planning section, asked about CMAC. I was told no. Uh, a brainstorm is still. I figured the VRU funded, the very vulnerable road user funding. That'd be perfect for this because it seems like it's made for something like this. So I go back to safety and ask about VRU funding and get told no. So I tried HSIP, no. CMAC, no. <laughs> VRU, no. I said, all right, you know what? I'm going to ask for state funds. So I went down to the third floor and asked for state funds. Now, I've never actually been laughed out of an office before. <laughs> it's about as close as I came, uh, the first time at least. So we're back to square one. I didn't have any way to, you know, supplement the funding and help out. But then I, you know, I looked at this part in the law, which is a little part that caught my eye that no longer does each project have to be 80-20, just the program as a whole has to be 80-20. So I started thinking, all of these local costs that we've been putting on the small communities and the big communities for design and, and construction engineering inspection, those are 100% local, but they're still part of the project. So if I take one of these projects in the urbanized areas and I collect everything, I'm still only doing 80-20 for construction with the federal money, but I add in their design fees and I add in their CE and I. Well, that whole project now instead of 80 20, actually, if you look at the whole budget, it's about 66 34. So that gives me a whole bunch of wiggle room that I can go over to the smaller communities. And now I can fund their design at 100%, fund their construction engineering at 100%, and take their construction match to 95 5 instead of 80 20. So you go back to that example before from Grand Coteau with the $200,000 that they would need for that sidewalk. Well, now they're down with 5% liability on their local construction match. And we're going to take care of all the design, the construction engineering. So now they get that exact project they were so excited about for $25,000 instead of $200,000. Yeah. So I And Brian, just to clarify, the bigger communities, they're not actually, doesn't cost them anything. More. Doesn't cost any, whether we do this or not, they pay the exact same thing. We're just capturing what they're paying and using that to you know, quote unquote subsidize some of the smaller communities. So while Brian and I are having these conversations and a lot of waiting where we feel like, well, maybe this idea will work. No, it doesn't work. Well, maybe this idea will work. And you know, there's a lot of holding in of the breath. I kind of made a timeline of how long did this actually take? So all these changes took place in less than a year. The CDC webinar was last February. I reached out to Marisa, like, help me even think through this in March. Brian and I started meeting in April. Brian starts, uh, uh, you know, aggressively pushing through these ideas in May through July. And then he kind of came up with the viable solution in August. He got verbal approval in September. And this whole time I'm thinking, even if DOTD does everything we ask, it's still going to be a problem for our rural communities to apply. You know, it's just the application itself is intimidating. How are they going to know about this project? What if Brian gets all this money and no one applies? I mean, I'm, you know, that's in the back of my mind. So I um, had a conversation with Marisa from Safe and um, from um, Safe Roots. I talked to Brian about the idea of having a rural complete street summit. So what we did is we brought in 13 communities and um, with at least four community members. They had to have an elected official as one of them. 
And I matched a mentor with each community for this day long training. So I got a bunch of volunteers from DOTD. I pulled in all my favors, you know, my uh, planners, engineers, everyone had their own mentor. And then there were sessions that um, each community rotated through on how to create a complete streets policy, how to create a complete streets plan, how to gather equitable community input. Brian led a session on how to fund it. They're, they were so excited, but I had FHWA and DOTD lead the sessions. So I kind of talked to them what I was hoping they would do. And, and it was a lot of, of buy-in. And um, so that was super helpful. Out of that training, so here are 10 of the communities, 10 of the 13, you'll see these are the actual people that were at the tables for those communities. They're, um, they're all putting in TAP applications. Brian has some of them already. And these, these teams are led by like the town librarian, the 4-H agent, one of them's led by a banker, um, someone pulled in their regional safety coordinator to work on their application. So, so generally it's not the elected official that actually put together the TAP application, though the elected official is a part of the process. It's truly like a community-led process. But not all the 13 communities were are able to do it yet. Um, so, um, the picture that you see is actually, uh, myself with a different hair color and Mary Alexander, um, and we were working on some planning there. And so I can say that the city of Tallulah is working on their application and they've gotten things in, but they already had some works done that they were able to just kind of adapt and put towards this application. Unfortunately, St. Joseph did not have that little leg up for this round of grant funding. Um, and that's largely due to the fact that they didn't have access to an engineer that could help them with a cost estimate, as well as capacity. Uh, the mayor there, he's actually a teach history teacher, a basketball coach, the mayor of St. Joseph, <laughs> on top of having his family and his life, you know? So it, it's very difficult to, you know, ask him, hey, can you fill out this application? Which I definitely did, hey. <laughs> but, um, but the, the point is, you know, we still have a lot of barriers in our rural communities um, when it comes down to these applications. And even though there's been so much great work to focus on us rurally, we still have a ways to go. Yep. And, and Brian made this application so simple, but the cost barrier is something he can't, I mean, they have to have a cost estimate. Mm -hmm. And so that cost estimate for some communities is still a real barrier. Okay, next steps actually, um, through our work with uh, the LSU Ag Center, and uh, just the partnerships that we've made that have actually gone into other communities and feedback we've received from those communities just during the application process, this is still brand new. We've actually got some traction on the state level. And I, I never stopped asking. So finally, I don't know if they shut me up or if they'd like the idea, but in our next house bill, there's a right item for funding state funds for this program specifically so that we don't have to subsidize with the NPOs. We're gonna be able to do this on our own independently uh, with state funds. So that's a big question. And uh, another thing that we plan to do is I'm gonna be hiring these consultants to do the design for the smaller areas. We're gonna use these same consultants to do technical assistance, which means they, they're gonna be in the communities writing these applications. So the mayor won't have to do a cost estimate. We're gonna fund that because the, the new law allows 5% of your funding to be used for technical assistance. And we're gonna use all 5% to get these things written, you know, through our partnerships with Jessica and Joy and all the others out there, they're going to attend the complete street summits. They're going to be sitting at those tables with the small communities. And we want these small communities to be examples for the next summit. We can say before and after, um, you know, we'll learn from them. And one last thing, I know we're talking about rural right now. That's the way we're starting in Louisiana because we are a pretty rural state. But once, if this house bill passes and we get that funding, we're also going to ex expand into our urban areas and reach those underserved communities because there's a whole equity component that we're not addressing right now. There are distress, there are low income, there are, are transit dependent areas inside the MPOs. They're just they're underserved right now. So we're taking care of the funding for the rural areas. And once we have enough, we're going to take care of that funding for the underserved inside the urbanized areas as well. And what do you think the match would probably look like for the urban? It's going to be about 5% for those two. For the distressed areas in, in urban areas. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So just a reminder, all states 
have this money. It's increased in all of your states. There's new flexibility in all of your states. So there's there's opportunity. How Brian figured this out in Louisiana, it may be a different pathway, but please reach out to us because we have notes on all of the pathways that failed that may work where you are. <laughs> Um, and just parting shots, like well, any last words, Brian? Yeah, actually I do. Um, but I'm a transportation engineer. I work for the Department of Transportation. When I look at Louisiana State University, it's our, our flagship university, it's our ag center, but I saw zero correlation to what, what they do and what I do. But I was lucky enough to find a champion like Jessica and like Joy that they're really out there for the rural communities. They're doing what I can't do. So I would suggest find the partner or the champion in your state. And I mean, it's going to be maybe the last place you ever thought you'd find them. Like, I, But you'll find them and they're, they're out there. They're doing great work. So use every avenue that's out there. And then as far as a funding thing, you know, this is Louisiana specific. You guys might have different setups. But my whole thing, I get tired of hearing that's just the way we've always done things. So I just, I, I mean, I just encourage you guys to think differently. Joy? Um, so the first thing that comes to mind closing um, is a quote <laughs> that also comes from one of my conversations with Mayor Alexander, where he said he felt like TAP was the next best step in order to move his community forward. And for as long as I can, I'm going to make sure that I'm sticking with this partner to make sure that we keep this momentum going. I want you all to take away from this that Y'all, I mean, y'all should already know this work takes time. This work takes a lot of time. And it's important that you keep your partners engaged, but not just your elected officials and your stakeholders. Your everyday people matter too. So just make sure that you're not, that you're, you know, talking to everybody on every level and make sure that you're sticking with it, pushing through, because we plant seeds so that our grandchildren may enjoy their fruit. So let's keep planting these seeds and let's take, keep taking care of this thing. And if you have questions, reach out to us. We're happy to answer. Well, we've had some, yeah, we've definitely had some questions. I know I'm, I'm coming in probably over the over the PA here. I, I maybe maybe you can hear me there. Uh, we've had some questions from uh, both, I think, online, maybe and in person. So, could, are you ready for that, Jessica? Yes. Okay, I'm trying to stop sharing. Okay, here we go. Awesome. Um, I don't have a video, so I'm like, yeah, we're good to go. Um, so yeah, I, I think one of, one of them, I, I think I should, we should mention that just a plug for, for our work on Capitol Hill tomorrow, I'm just going to say, um, that one of the, one of the things that the funding, the match difficulty that Brian mentioned, I just want to, to note to everybody that the, 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 the Langen camp, the safety bill that we're, that we're proposing uh, tomorrow on Capitol Hill will help solve that, that challenge with the match, which we know is enormous. So thank you for pointing that out. Um, well, there was a question here for Brian. I'll, I'll just put it to you first. You know, I don't think that, you know, I don't think our DOT uh, tap manager would be willing to make these kinds of changes like you were. How would you suggest that we engage our DOT tap manager to try to make a similar change? I'm going to answer first and I'll let Brian. So I sent him a cold call email and I put a lot of time in how to word this email. <laughs> so I pitched it as, you know, Brian, you know, I'm Jessica Stroop. I'm at LSU Ag Center and I'm very interested in how can we help rural communities put in quality applications? Because I knew he was getting a lot of bad, you know, rough applications. Mm -hmm. and, and then I said, you know, I'm also interested in new flexibility within the IIJA. So I try to present myself as, Maybe I can make your job easier, which that's not true. I've made your job. Easier. <laughs> a little bit, a little bit. But uh, gosh, as far as engaging your program manager to make some changes, I initially I'm a little shocked that they wouldn't be open to the changes. It seemed to be in everybody's best interest. Um, we have a dedicated funding amount for you know, less than 5,000, then five to 50,000, 50 to 200 and greater than 200. If you're anything like Louisiana, all you can spend is the greater than 200,000. So I think making any changes to avoid any lapsing funds is, I mean, that's basic. The first meeting I had with Brian, I went with the printout of the amount of money he was sitting on. So Marisa from Safe Routes Partnership created a handout 
So I had exactly how much money he had not spent for 5,000, for communities under 5,000 with me. And you responded that so graciously. Yeah. <laughs> well, that, I mean, that's how really how to great. I was going to say, yeah, I mean, the, and that data is available for everyone, right? So when we have, we have that information for every state. So uh, that's an important part of this. I think, you know, Brian, you made a really great point of like, just like, like, why wouldn't they? I think, you know, we, um, uh, I think we're maybe even more inspired to to try and go back and, and, and the way that Jessica, you know, d- did this, you know, I think we're all inspired to, to like actually uh, do it that way, you know, and like, let's, let's, let's just like, let's try, let's try again and say, Hey, you know, you're sitting on all this money. Like let's, let's, let's do something together here. Um, there's a question in here for joy. Um, do you, do you have to, do you have to convince, um, communities to pursue this application after having negative experiences with either this funding source or other grant applications? Like what worked well, what advice would you share um, for us to convince communities that have had negative experiences in the past? Um, As far as negative experiences go, I would say find the why, like whomever it is that you're that your community is going to for this type of project, like find the why behind the what and make that make sense for them. Um, like say, for example, if, if the community, like if you go to the community and say, hey, I, we want to do this, this is important. And they say, well, no, economic development is more important. Well, these two things hold hands. So identify what areas actually connect with their why and make it work. <laughs> and consistency and yes, persistence yes. because <laughs> it, it, sometimes you have to stay on people sometimes especially in rural communities small town politics sometimes you can shake hands with one person and then that one person will communicate with somebody else and next thing you know you're either the big talk and everything is great or hold on I have to find that why behind that what but the thing is it can be done with consistency um and with time because these things, again, they just take a lot of time. Joy has an incredible relationship with the town clerk in Tallulah. She has yes. gotten to know her really well. She stops by her desk regularly. Oh, so it's an incredible <laughs> amount of persistence on Joy's part. Absolutely. That's great. Yeah, I, I think the process, one of the questions was like, just the process of engagement and identifying community leaders. I mean, that's pretty, I mean, it's a basic component to doing this. Like any tips on, you know, that process, doing it right, identifying those leaders. I mean, that complete street summit. I mean, that was incredible. Like how, how, how do you identify and like engage, you know, like what, what are some exam- examples of, you know, how to do that best? So with building our community, with our community coalitions, again, we're not focused on just talking to the heads of the community. We're talking to the to the everyday people as well. And I think it's through those conversations and building rapport with those community leaders, um, because there's a there's a food systems element to what we do too. So for, for example, if I work with a food pantry manager who just so happens to be a pastor or first lady of one of our churches, and there's an event, and you know, that's where we're, you know, we're building the rapport, we're out in the community, we're being visible. Um, and we're just making those connections. If I see someone and they say, well, hey, my, I'm working on this with my program in this community. Well, I say, well, hey, here's my coalition, my information. Um, we have a coalition meeting on Thursday and you should come. So it's, it's really just networking. It's just networking in the community and not being afraid to talk to people. Um, I'm from Louisiana. We don't meet strangers. And there's probably a few of y'all that have heard me talking like this around here, but Seriously, it's really just about making sure that, you know, you're telling the people what it is that you're trying to do and just garnering that support by networking. And I mean, that's really just how we've built the coalitions and getting their their equitable input is also important, too, um, because we can't make changes without without the community. So if we're making the changes that they want to see, they will rally behind us and then they'll bring their friends and their family. And next thing you know, we have a big coalition. One big brief example of how Joy did this is her community coalition wanted to do a health fair, but Joy's like, that's really not a CDC priority. So she turned it into a walking audit health fair. So she got each of the- <laughs> it was, That was the Madison on the crawl yeah. event, yeah. So yeah. she got all the healthcare partners to set up across mm-hmm. the town in the main pedestrian corridor. And then we got the partners involved in like the priorities of the walk audit and the people walked to get all the goodies at each station. Mm-hmm. And that's how they, that's how she did that. That was all joy. Yeah. Do we, are, I got to ask, are there, are there joys and Jessica's in every state out there? Uh, like, are there like the hop, the hop team everywhere? Like, how do we connect with you? 
Uh, well, so cooperative, all SNAP ed programs have active friendly routes as a part of their priorities. So even if your state does not have hop funding, you do have SNAP ed. They don't have quite as much money or time, but it is a priority. So getting to know your cooperative extension physical activity person, um, your SNAP ed, PI, and if you have hop, definitely start there. But cooperative extension, they're everywhere, everywhere. Yeah. That's great. And this this you know, we've been asked, I think a couple of questions are like, is the league gonna make a checklist of all this? And like, are we gonna, you know, like like there's a lot going on here, right? That we need to know. I mean, I think there's some basic stuff about engagement and knowing that there's money and that this can be done. And you've been really, I think, inspired a lot of folks to to go and um try this different approach. Um, but we will definitely have to be post, you know, we, we have to, there's a model here and we need to post, we'll be posting this along with every other presentation and it will be, it, it will live in this, uh, the Whova platform uh, for at least six months, I believe. And then we'll, then we'll move it to YouTube or whatever we do, but this is absolutely um, really, really gold stuff. You know, this is great, really, really helpful for, for folks out there. Um, there was a question about um, uh, here about the re the possibility of reduced matched funds for underserved areas. When is that happening? Is that is that is was that a is that I didn't hear that part. So I just want to make sure was there was there a was there a possibility of like uh, reduced match funds um, for underserved oh, areas? Yeah. yeah. Well, right yeah. now, Why, any any all right. No, any ahead. transportation alternatives project can be funded. 100% federally, but the entire program still has to be 80-20. So it requires overmatch from a different project to offset whatever funding you put on. So yeah, uh, we went with 95-5 for construction, uh, but you know when you add everything else in, it ends up being about 96-4, 97-3, but we offset it by those other larger projects being about 65-35. But you're planning to do that the next round for the urban areas, right? That's the... If I get that state funding yeah, here, yeah. yes. <laughs> okay, yeah. When, and when... Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and you said um, HSIP, CMAC, VRU funding, they're, they're not allowed as options for the match. Is that, that's not Louisiana specific. Uh, other states allow those funding sources to be used for the match? No. HSIP was just added in the new law as a potential match for TAP. It was right. just a Louisiana yeah. issue that we shouldn't work out to use yeah. it. Well, you're really on the ground. You're doing that. I know this is kind of a softball for Karen Whitaker, who's sitting like to your side there, you know, about and and I think that again, back to the back to the work that we're doing, uh, you know, tomorrow on Capitol Hill, trying to have a workaround for this. So everybody, you know, we that 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 match we all know is a uh, is is an impediment. And you know, we've we've seen these examples of really creative ways of doing this incredibly creative. Thank you for doing that. Um, I'm looking to see if there's any more questions from the group. Um, Anybody else? Absolutely. Okay, let me repeat the question. So he said, So the question is, um, did Joy uh, partner with faith based groups and did she have any novel approaches? Um, so we partner with faith with faith based groups and they're often the ones that um, give us the community input because they'll have like their church events and we'll go support them or they'll say hey Joy, we have this event I'll set up a table and do um, now our food our, our, um, our faith based organizations are more, more closely tied to our food systems work because they are our food pantry managers like every single out of all the five, six, six food pantries that we serve across Madison and Tensaw, all of them are in churches. And those barriers with physical activity, honestly, I, I, I wouldn't say that there are too many because they they give us input. They are, yeah, they, they give us the input that we often don't get a chance to hear. So, but we, we're definitely working with them. We've had another parish that sent and um, put in the church bulletin uh, an opportunity for community members mm -hmm. to give um, input on what the most dangerous intersection sections where they live were and we got great feedback from the church bulletin inserts and actually at our last walk audit um if you remember the picture where i said my first my first grade teacher miss harris was waving um one of those was actually um pastor tommy watson and pastor tommy watson runs an annual bike ride every single year so i'm making it after being here i'm making it my, my business <laughs> so get with him on his bike ride so that we can enhance see how we can enhance what they're doing because they are very important to our rural communities. Yeah. Absolutely. Over here. There was one question. Well, I was just going to mention, 
Kind of go to the doctor or ACIP funds up to the federal highway. You need to um, probably ask early in the fiscal year. Um, it helps because uh, sometimes they may burn through and you know, the answer may be no because they've already you know, spent, you know, used up all those funds. So asking early in the cycle might help. Sure, they, sure. I think we have, so. you have to follow the local rules that exist with the vision office when those are available or not. But if they are, you need that early in the cycle. So, no, I agree. Could, I think could you, yeah, could you restate was, the question if it's possible to summarize a little bit, maybe for the folks at home? The question was, did we ask early in the cycle to use the HSIP funds because sometimes it's a timeline related issue? But I'll have Brian. Respond. Yeah, we actually we asked very early. I think uh, plus we have a problem spending our HSIP funds already. Yeah. So um, I said, well, you have a problem spending it. Why can't I use it for match? You know, I help you spend it. But there was a a little disconnect between the intent of the law and what's actually written. So maybe at the division office, or maybe it's at the state level, like uh, state DOT level. Whereas, you know, even though a side path is a proven safety countermeasure, is that really a safety project? So there was a little disconnect in that. Um, so that's why I just decided to go a different way for now. But I hope we can change that moving forward. Um, I have a question about uh, when you get a tab <laughs> funded uh, or approved at the state level, what entity at the town level has to say, okay, we accept it? And do you run into problems there um, when other people that weren't part of your process now get a chance to vote it they down? So it's, it was a question about when a TAP project is accepted, like which local entity processes it? Sort of, yeah, accept the accept funds, the funds. To manage it and get it done. Yeah, Brian's got a good system. <laughs> well, I don't know if it's, it's a pilot system, so <laughs> we're gonna see because we're really trying to reach these communities that we haven't reached before. Um, some of these areas are actually census designated places, they don't, they're not incorporated, so they need to. Because I have to have an NC state agreement with somebody, and a census designated place, I can't do that. So they need to enter into some type of agreement with their local municipality. And normally it's the parish government. And we've had really good experience doing that so far. Um, the parish government will work with the locals and they will actually submit the application on behalf of whoever it is. Uh, Bell Rose is yeah. a good example. It's an assumption parish. Small, small area, not incorporated, but they have these great ideas and we want to help them. So assumption parish is a, is submitting applications on their behalf and that's who we'll enter into the agreement with and, uh, we haven't had any negative issues with it yet he requires all the resolutions in the application though so that's been a part of my work is to help the entities okay make sure you pass your model resolutions way ahead of time so the the, the group that's submitting the, the application and the group that receives the money have to have all that as a part of the application yeah that was one of the barriers in st john so I think I think I think we'll probably wrap up. Um, unfortunately, it's um, we're at time, and I just want to say let's keep the conversation going. Thanks again for this incredible panel, and uh, clearly we need to have this kind of team everywhere. Uh, and so uh, I hope I know you all are inspired, and we'll keep the conversation going there in person. And uh, look forward to um, sending you now to your next sessions, which start at 2.30. Um, first, I, I just wanna, I wanna say how grateful we are for, um, we're gonna show a video here, uh, a, a film here in a minute uh, to close out this session. We're really grateful for the ongoing support of our friends at SRAM. Um, they, not, they don't only make great gear, but they're making a major investment in bike advocacy and helping grow bicycling. And as a platinum level sponsor, you typically get some time on the program to speak. And they generously opted to instead showcase an excellent video from the Black Foxes um, that they help support. And uh, also, I have to give a special shout out and thanks to the filmmaker, who Jalen uh, Bazile, who is the outdoor organizer and facilitator of the Black Foxes for joining us at the summit. Uh, the Black Foxes is an international collective of eight unapologetically Black cyclists and outdoors people that are reclaiming their narratives and roles in the outdoors. So over that, and thanks again.
Oh, I guess he's going to share. Should we move? He has concentration phase. We need to we need to move. Once again, a little bit of uh, technical difficulties here. Um, give me one second. Sorry, Jalen. Writing my bike is a crucial part of my self-care. It allows me the time and space to kind of reset. Kind of allows allows that that moment of relief from the kind of ongoing weight of that, that I feel like I'm carrying with the world. For us to really talk about and and to practice creating this safe space emotionally and physically was a uh, important goal uh here in this bike packing trip my name is Jalen Bazil I chose Crestview for this bike packing trip because the wildflowers and the landscape this area is just one of my favorites to ride we had an amazing group meet up here a couple years ago where the BIPOC community of mountain biking and cycling got together. I'm always someone who's really struggled with mental health or in particular like anxiety and depression. So for me to even be able to talk about it openly and publicly, it's actually a really big deal because you know, where I grew up, like you don't talk about stuff like that. My name is Eric Arce. So I remember I wrote a piece about mental health. You know, I was really worried to put myself out there, but I got so many messages in my inbox about, you know, how they could relate. It's been really helpful to open up that kind of vulnerability and then also share it with others. My mental health with the state of the world and all the current events and news stories recently, it has taken a toll and it's been difficult. My name is Evan Green. To be honest, I've just now started to acknowledge some of the things I've been feeling and going through. And I do feel that just being able to get on the bike sometimes is really beneficial to clear my head. It often feels a little escapist, like I get to go and, you know, take a break from the world, which I think we all deserve. And it's a break that I feel more energized and more whole and aware when I come back into the world. I really like too that I'm able to photograph and just bike and you're kind of, you know, since you're going in these remote places, you don't really have service. So you're not really connected to the outside world in that way. And I like being able to disconnect. What I love about bikepacking is just the ability to go further and see more and experience living on the bike. You know, it's that combination of bike backpacking and biking. I think biking makes me happy in the sense that it is very present. I can kind of have my head on a swivel enough to take in the land around me, but otherwise I'm focusing on what's coming up ahead. I'm focusing on my breathing, you know, how my legs feel, moving the bike underneath me. It 
is this really like rhythmic dynamic with the bike and the land and, and my body. I'm a person that doesn't really like to address my feelings or even acknowledge that they exist, nonetheless other people's feelings, and that that's one of my weaknesses. So it's something I've been working on is to try to connect more with what I'm feeling. And bikepacking, you have no choice but to connect with what's happening and be present with yourself and sometimes the bugs and the weather and the other people that you're with on the trip. In 2020, we had this really important moment to change things right within biking culture and biking industry. And we, it was a, a moment for us to look inward, right? But now I see things kind of reverting back to the way things were. And that's really frustrating because I think we need to keep this momentum going um, because all these little individual actions, whether it's culture, or industry, really impacts a lot of people. And we really need to take that into account. I want to tell the men in my life to, to really embrace what they feel, because that is the way. We're not going to get forward without addressing what has happened to us. And I think I see so many of us out here trying to break records or to go, you know, summit peaks and, and be in the most physically fit shape. And we need that same dedication to what we feel, our emotions and our mental health. And that all of us are not going to move forward unless we join that. Yeah, I really want to. I really want to see us grow. I really want to see us heal.